it's actually very difficult to get off your ass and put down these distractions and focus on something sustaining and complicated and causing some degree of difficulty and anxiety. And many, many young people, I think, find it very difficult to do that. What's up, everybody, and welcome to the show today. We drop great content each and every week, and we want to make sure that you guys get notified. And in order to do that, you're going to have to smash that subscribe button and hit that notification bell. And if you've gotten a lot of value out of this, make sure you give us a like and share our videos with your friends. If you want to look at the happiest countries in the world, you just find the richest countries for the most part. And those are people when people say they're happiest. But if you want to look at the countries where people say they have the most meaning in life, you look for the poorest countries where people actually say their lives have more meaning. Because if you're struggling each day, your work has a sort of meaning it doesn't have if you're fairly prosperous and protected. And, and, um, and so part of the question is, what does one do if one's in a bullshit job? And the glib answer is find a better job. But, you know, maybe you can't find a better job. Maybe, maybe, or, or maybe you don't want to take the hit or maybe you don't want to lose your health insurance or whatever. So if you can't do that, find meaning in other aspects of your life. And, you know, and, and I, have, I, I have a lot of friends who are, live and have very rewarding jobs, but I also have friends who don't have rewarding jobs and they go, they do their stuff, and then they do something else. Well, I think we're seeing this with the great resignation. You know, we have more jobs available, but more unemployed than ever. And it's confounding a lot of economists around, well, wait a second, we thought if there were jobs, people would naturally take the jobs. And we're now realizing that compensation and even happiness are not as important as meaningful work. And for many, meaning was lost once we had to work from home and we didn't have that connectedness. We were just on screens all day. I wonder, as a parent, as you think through navigating raising children, and this idea of happiness versus meaning. You know, how do you strike that balance and support your children as they navigate this? I think it's easier for us as we are older to realize meaning in our life, but for many of our younger listeners, that search for meaning in the very beginning of their career is, is very difficult. It's tough, and it's particularly tough now. Um, there are so many things trying to pull you away from meaning and purpose and sustained practice. Everything from, you know, Facebook to, to Twitter to TV streaming services and everything. We don't have to struggle boredom anymore in this modern world. I have my, I have my iPhone next to me. I could always check my email or go online and so on. And so it's actually very difficult to get off your ass and put down these distractions and focus on something sustaining and complicated and causing some degree of difficulty and anxiety. And many, many young people, I think, find it very difficult to do that. Life, there's just too many other, other distractions. And that's, that's, that's hard. You know, the book that's probably influenced me the most in my life is Mahali Csikszentmihalyi's book, Flow talks about sort of sustained experience. When you're really into something, you lose track of time, you don't, you forget to eat, you just zoomed in, focused on hard intellectual work. But he does these surveys, and a lot of people don't ever have flow in their lives. They're always just, you know, just going around and never fully engaged. So it's, it's difficult. I just appreciate the difficulty. Some things get you out of it, music, Musical performance is a way of, of, of getting a sustained attention focus. Sports, certainly. Writing, reading sometimes. Um, early in the book, you were, you were laying out the argument of being able to explore and, and especially exploring these emotions in your mind. And for myself, uh, I'm not into horror movies or anything like that. However, the music that I listen to it is certainly on, it can be very dour and it can be very dark and n nothing makes me feel the way that that music does. And for the average listener or somebody 
who just came upon it by chance, I think it might horrify them. <laughs> Where for, for myself, I find it harrowing and and lifting and just so dramatic. And, and of course, I think back to Wagner or some of the other more controversial artists whose music was so dark comparatively to, to the other artists of the times. And or the first time I there was a, a seeing a show live where I started to weep because of the emotions that I was feeling in in that performance and how much I chase those moments. We drop great content each and every week and we want to make sure that you guys get notified. And in order to do that, you're going to have to smash that subscribe button and hit that notification bell. And if you've gotten a lot of value out of this, make sure you give us a like and share our videos with your friends. That's such a good counter argument against those who would say, well, we just want to have happiness. We just want to kind of boost up on the pleasurable emotions, you know, joy, sexual satisfaction, satiation, you know, exhilaration, all those positive things. It doesn't describe people. We often enjoy sampling negative emotions. We often enjoy sampling fear and regret and sadness in, in the right doses, in controlled circumstances. But there's something um, Michael Norton calls emo diversity which is the idea that, that we, we want to get a range of different emotions sometimes. A full life involves getting this and that, trying out different things. So, you know, we, you would imagine, all of the sort of hedonistic theories of human nature would say we avoid being frightened, because being frightened is bad. And yet, there we are going to haunted houses and seeing the most disgusting and terrifying horror movies, or listening, listening to songs that, that, you know, that freak us out or make us cry. So this is a wonderful case. You touched on religion earlier, and you think about all the great religions involve characters who suffer. Good, amazing people who suffer. And through suffering, we come to worship them. We don't go to movies to just see people experiencing happy for two and a half hours. We don't go and seek out this entertainment that just is hedonistic and pleasure-filled. Almost all stories that we share as humans across centuries, generations, cultures even, have suffering baked into the storyline. They have a hero's journey that we're drawn to. Do you feel that this is something that crosses all cultures and we all as humans are drawn to? Because you mentioned earlier, you know, some of the more happy cultures, some of, some of these differences we're seeing in meaning even are cultural. Some things are cultural. There's cross-cultural differences in the sort of suffering people enjoy, in the sort of pleasures people like. Uh, there's also individual differences. Sometimes people don't like horror movies. Other people like spicy food. Some people don't. But there are also universals. And I think you're touching on an important universal, which is just like the lives we want to live require suffering and struggle, the stories we want to watch and listen to and read about also involve the same thing. You know. The, you ask, what is a story? What does a story have to have to be a story? And one answer, I think a good answer is, it has to involve somebody facing an obstacle. It could be funny, it could be the obstacle, it could be a, could be a, a fun rom-com with couple friends get together. It could be the most horrible Holocaust narrative of people trying to survive. But you need an obstacle. And this sets up the possibility of a hero's journey, it, but also sets up the possibility for somebody just struggling. And as soon as you get to struggle, you get to difficulty, and you're on your way to, to suffering. The obstacle doesn't even have to be surmounted. You know, Rocky finished the fight, but he didn't win. I don't want to run to spoil a lot of movies, but some of my favorite sports movies, they don't end up winning at the end. But they, they fight a lot, and that's interesting. That, that just catches us. My favorite movie that ends that way is The Bad News Bears, but the struggle that those children go through and what they learned about themselves and the connection that they had with their fellow teammates that they wouldn't have had without the struggle and the suffering of playing on this horrible baseball team. And the only way that they were going to get to a place of feeling good about themselves is to figure out how to connect and win as a team rather than the uh, be individually. And I mean, that that movie, seeing it, uh, I'm 48, so I saw it at a very tender age, which also set up 
probably a, a lot of wanting to, to connect with other kids as well. And also feeling a bit of a of an outcast as that whole team was basically made up of outcasts and being able to see something that you can relate to. And though I, we can overcome together, like we can, we can become something that perhaps we maybe don't feel or are individually. 